For by grace we have been saved through faith. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's truth through the preaching of his word, which begins with prayer. Let us pray together. Gracious Father, you have inspired us through the writings of Holy Scripture for our learning. Help us to hear, read, and understand, and deeply absorb Scripture so that we may embrace and always hold on to the blessed hope of eternal life given to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I have a question to ask you that you can ponder. Have you ever experienced, have you ever experienced a truly life-changing event? A truly life-changing event. Now, many of us have experienced major events in our lives, and, and, and sometimes these major events have led to us changing our daily routine. But I'm talking about a truly life-changing event, something that changes the very core, the very core of your being, changes your very nature, so to speak. In the passage we just had read, the Apostle Paul reminds the people of the church at Ephesus that by God's grace, they have been changed. God's grace has changed them from what, from what they were to who they are. From what they were to who they are. That's a truly life-changing event. Something similar happened years ago. As a matter of fact, for, for centuries, for centuries, Doctors have wondered whether a person who was born blind at birth, born blind, sees the world, perceives the world in the same way as a person who is born with sight, with eyesight. Think about that. Does a person born blind from birth, born from, has always been blind, do they perceive, do they see the world in the same way that you perceive it, you who have eyesight? Now, when you think about that, when you try to evaluate something like that, something like that, uh, we have to remember that perceiving the world is more than eyesight. Okay, we can see something, but to perceive it, it takes more than eyesight. And we know this is true because perceiving or seeing and perceiving are two different things. And we know that's true because if, if perceiving and seeing were the same thing, we could get a camera and put it on your car and let the car go on its own and it would drive itself, but it doesn't, right? But manufacturers are trying to do that even now. They're working on it now. But the biggest problem that automakers are having with cars that drive themselves, so to speak, is perception. While they may get an image by the camera, they don't, they're, they're not perceiving, the, the camera doesn't perceive what it's seeing. Is that object right there? Is that object a little boy? Or is it a fire hydrant? You know, perception. You can see something, but you may not perceive it. That's the difficulty. Now, there are a lot of cases. They're surprising. There are some cases where a person was actually born completely blind, and maybe their sight or part of their sight was restored at a very young age. But most of the time, that happens when they're very young. Now, there was a case years ago uh, of a, uh, about a woman from India. She was born totally blind. And she grew up blind. And the only thing she could see is night and day. Daylight, nighttime. Night and day, dark and light. That's all she could perceive. She could tell you that, whether it was day or night. But when she was 12 years old, that 12 years old is, is living like that for years. When she was 12 years old, she underwent a, a surgery to restore her eyesight. Overnight, overnight, she experienced the world in a 
whole new way, a totally different way. Now, 20 years later, it's been over 20 years since she had that surgery. That young lady now is working. She's able to get around without her cane. She goes to work and back, and she lives what we would consider a, a normal life. But the question that researchers have is that because, because she didn't re receive her eyesight till she was much older, until she uh, until she was twelve, is her that she visually perceive the world as everyone else does. Well, think about that. Now you've had eyesight all your life, and if you saw an elephant, what would you say? Ah, that's an elephant. Now, I'd be surprised to see one here in San Antonio, but let's say you were at the zoo or something. That's an elephant. Okay. Now, let's say you were blind, and they gave you, all of a sudden, the next day, they, they restored your sight, and the next day, you go to the zoo, and you see an elephant. You'd go like, what? You've never seen an elephant. You've heard about an elephant. An elephant's been described to you. You may have touched an elephant. You've never seen it. So it's a totally different way. It's a totally different way of perceiving it. Now, the lady in India who had her eyesight restored, she they had the question, is she perceiving, is she seeing the world the way we see it? And, and she said that she doesn't recognize faces. She has a very difficult time of doing that. She also has a difficult time uh, looking at gazes, where people gaze to the left or to the right, to the right and to the left. She can't tell which way they're gazing. She has other issues other perception issues that you and I don't have. This is a, this is a, a this, this was a major, a tremendous change in her life. And the, the big question for her was uh, that, that, that she is overcoming, overcoming is perceptual awareness, perceptual awareness. That's our passage. That's our passage. When God enters our lives, when God opens our eyes to perceive him, he also opens our, our ears to understand him. He gives us a heart of flesh. He takes away our heart of stone so we can receive him. That is a tremendous life-changing event. That's what we would call a born-again event a born-again event, you would perceive the world in a much different way than you did before. Make no mistake about it. That the gift of grace for salvation's sake is only from God. God is the only one that can give us that grace. God's saving grace received through faith in Jesus Christ brings life to our dead souls transforming our relationship with him, our influence on others, and our impact in our community. It changes everything. It changes everything. Our passage today is about the grace of God and how it changes everything if you're truly born again. Now, we break this passage down. It's 10 verses, and we break it down, verses 1, 2, 3, that it talks about how God's grace changes us from who we were, who we were. We were dead. We were dead. In fact, it talks about how we were blind even to the fact that we were dead, spiritually dead. And verses 4 through 7 discuss how God's grace changes us to who we are, who we are right now, alive in Christ. And then verses uh, 8 through 10, uh, it talks about how God's grace changes us for something, something, something. Now, some of us think that God saves us so we can live a happy life and so we can you know, uh, go to heaven, and it does, it, it does. I mean, perspective, you change your perspective, there's joy in your heart, you know that life is beyond, life is eternal. But he saves you for a purpose. 
And that purpose is for others. That purpose is for him to serve him. He saves us for good works, for good works. What to do, what to do. And it impacts every one of us, okay? Whether, whether you're young or old, a student, adult, grandpa, it changes everybody in the same way. Let us look at the, the first part of the passage. Uh, God's grace changes us from who we were. We were dead. We were dead. Scripture tells us we were spiritually dead in our trespasses. We start looking at the passage and asking the question, who am I? Now, if you're in Christ, you ask the question, who was I? Who am I? Who was I? Who was I? Who were you before Christ saved you? Who were you before Christ saved you? By nature, the passage reveals that all of humanity is fallen. All of humanity is dead, living in a state of fallenness. So let's get to the nitty gritty, okay? In verses one, Paul, Paul reminds the people at the church of, at Ephesus that uh, about their fallen state of being until they have uh, until they came to faith in Jesus Christ our Lord Paul says that he tells us that we were children of wrath children of wrath whose wrath if we are children of wrath whose wrath God's wrath what is God's wrath what is that if somebody has wrath against you they have anger against you. They want the worst for you. They hate you. They want to destroy you. And Paul is telling us that before God saved you, 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 you were children of wrath, God's wrath. God was going to judge you perfectly, and that was going to condemn you. And that's what you deserved. That's tough, right? That is really tough. That's tough to believe. It's tough that God would have wrath against us. But God's word is saying that that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Why would he have wrath against us? Because we are sinners. Because we committed a grievous, grievous crime against him. You committed, we had committed a crime against him, against eternal God. That means our crime was an eternal crime. And so he has to judge that crime, and he does that by punishing us. That's what he does. He has to. He's a perfect God. And he will punish us perfectly. God's wrath. And so that's what's talked about in the first three verses. These verses describe how our past, how our state, how our past lives were before we were born again. Basically, they describe how we follow the desires of our hearts. And what is that? And that's right out of Scripture. It, text, it talks about, hey, you follow the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? Think about that right now. What is the desire of your heart right now? Right now, right now. Hey, man, I wish I could have a pizza for lunch. That's kind of a desire. for God, I didn't eat lunch. Oh, what, what are some other desires? Hey, I wish I had a better car. Oh, I wish, I wish I was in better shape. You know, I hadn't been able to work out. Sandy's been after me to work out. I hadn't been able to. The desires of my heart is to get myself... You know, desires of your heart. What are some big desires of your heart? Hey, be rich. Because you think that's going to buy you happiness. The desires of your heart. And Paul's saying that when you were living in your fallen state of being, your focus was on who? It was on you. It was a self-centered. And so you were pursuing the desires of your heart. That's what you were doing. You are not pursuing the desires of who? The desires of God. Even for a Christian, you're called to do that. Back in, way back before some of you were born, back in June of 2013. That's a long time ago, right? Let's do the math. Okay. Way back then, there was a story, that a movie that came out. It was World War Z. You remember it, okay. Brad Pitt. It was, it was popular. It was pre-COVID, so everybody would go see it at the movies. The premise of the movie is that there were zombies living. Well, zombies are dead. The living dead. There were zombies all over the place. Hey, here's what the problem was. The zombies didn't know they were dead. 
They didn't know they were dead. So they're going around and doing what zombies do. What do zombies do? They were pursuing living flesh. The people that were alive, they were pursuing. That's what zombies do. They were men. They were dead men and dead women walking. But they didn't know they were dead. Popular movie. Zombies do that. They are pursuing the desires of their heart. What were the desires of their heart? To, to eat living flesh. That's the desires of their heart. It, it is a movie that they were pursuing. Here's the irony. The irony of the movie is Holy Scripture tells us <clears throat> excuse me, that before God's grace saves us, we were spiritually dead. We were zombies. We were zombies. We were pursuing the desires of our flesh. We were pursuing the desires of the flesh. We were spiritually dead. We were following the ways of the sinful world. Hey, who would want to do that? What's the way of the sinful world that we live in? What's the way? You know, great, what's the great American dream? Have a house, have a car, have a family, be rich, do everything. Live like the, the best, uh, what's the reality shows out there, the best ones, that's how you want to live. And then when you look, you look at a reality show and it shows you they're going through all this trauma, they do it because if, if they were going through trauma, you ain't watching it. They, you want to know that other people are going through all the mess that you're living through. That's the desires of the world, the desires of the world. Let's get, let's get, let's get, be like the world. Let's get the, the good things. Is there anything wrong with having the good things in life? Anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. In fact, those are, you, could, you could interpret that as being blessings from God. The good things of the world are blessings from God if you know that they are blessings from God. If you give him all the glory. See, that's a perspective change. Hey, no, Manny, Pastor Manny, no, no, I worked hard. I have worked hard for this money. I stayed up late. I sacrificed everything. I lost my first wife. I gave up all my kids just so I could be in the position I'm in. Isn't that the reality of the world? Hey, no glory goes to God. Okay, he gave me the intellect, maybe, maybe. Self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Living for the glory of self. Our moral standards. Knowing what is right and wrong is based on what the world says is right and wrong. <clears throat> Not what Holy Scripture says. No, no. We don't want to do that. No, hey, let's talk among friends here. We do not want to do what Holy Scripture tells us to do. It is hard. No, really. No, I'm, I'm serious. It, it, it makes us feel very uncomfortable. When we get into Holy Scripture, hey, man, there's something wrong. Something wrong with the world. Something wrong with us. There's something wrong with me. And you know what? There is. And the Bible tells us that there is. And the Bible tells us that we're condemned, that we're going straight. Do not pass go. Do not collect your $200. You're going straight to hell. It even tells us that you've already been judged. You've already been judged. So what do we do? What, what is our hope? Woo. That's getting serious now. What does it look like? The Bible contradicts everything we do. The Bible contradicts everything, every way we want to live. It doesn't want us to live like that. Hey, you know what? You know why I don't want to be a Christian? You've heard this before. I'm waiting until right before I die, before I become a Christian. You know why? I can't have any fun. I can't do the things I want to do. See, if I become a Christian, if I give my life to Christ, if I am saved by the Lord, if I receive him as Lord, receive him as Lord is the key. That means you have to be obedient to him. There you go. You might as well just bury me right now. I'm not going to have any fun. Isn't that the deception of the world? That is the deception. 
of the world. Those of you who are true Christians know that's a deception. That's one of the biggest lies you could say. That is, that's from the devil. That you've never been happier. There's never been the joy that in your life than when God saved you. And now that, that, now that you're walking in his way, you never knew that you were spiritually saved. Well, we can say, wait a minute now. What is, what is living in sin look like? What is it? What does it mean to go after the desires of the world? Well, we can take, we'll take something easy, an example. Uh, it means pursuing your sinful desires. And, and it means that you're going to want to live life your way. Now, you can plug any sin in there, but I, I will do one easy. We'll do an example that's easy. If somebody has sex outside the marriage bed, outside of marriage, whether you've been married before or you're not married, God, God's word says you cannot have sex. Now, if you do, you're sinning. That's what it says. It's clear. I mean, they're just like, okay, well, maybe we got some exceptions here. There's no, there's no exceptions. But society doesn't say that. Society says, listen, the Bible is thousands and thousands of years old. That's old school thinking. That's not reality. That's what, this, that's what the world says. See, that's the world telling you that is not heard of nobody. You're not hurting anybody. You're not. That's what the world says. You're okay, Manny. You're okay. As Scripture says, you're sinning. And it has reason for telling us that. It's calling us to turn away from the world. It's calling us to turn to God and be healed. See, the good news of God's word is that God is a loving God. God is a God who forgives sin. He does. Isn't that wonderful? A loving God who forgives sin. Oh, so we're ready to turn to him. We're ready to receive him. We're going to confess our sins to him. We'll confess every sin we've ever can think of. It comes in our mind. We just repent. We confess. But there's a couple of sins. No, shh, shh. There's a couple of sins. I'm not going to, I'm not going to confess. I'm just going to keep them back here. Nobody knows about them. That's how we think. But God knows. And see, your relationship, see, that's the thing about it. When you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, He saves you from the fires of hell. He is your Lord, so you're submitting to His Lordship. So now you have this, what you can call a personal relationship with Him. He knows you personally. He knows the dark secrets. And so what are you, what are you hiding? Like, you want to hide that from Him? He knows that. You know what? I'm just going to think of it a different way. I'm going to think of it like this. See, you start changing it. And you know it's a sin. Just confess it. Now, listen, if it's something that you're having a difficult time with, you say, Lord, give me the grace. Give me the grace to overcome this. I can't do it on my own. I need your help. And what does he do? He gives you grace. He's a God who loves you, cares about you. If you believe in him, but if you believe in the world and saying the Bible is out of step with society, then you're following the dictates of the world. Your morality is with the world, not with God. God doesn't change. He is, he was, is, and will be forever. God, he does not change his mind. He doesn't say, you know, in the United States, those guys over there, they seem to think that this sin is okay. I mean, 90% of them think the sin is okay. So God's going to say, okay, you know what? Okay, we're going to accept that. That's not the way it works. God will punish that sin. You know what? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he hung on the cross, died for our sins, he did not die for the sins that you and I perceive are sins. He did not die for just the sins that you and I perceive are sins. He died for the sins that God perceives are sins. 
He died for the sins that God says, those are sins. He died for those sins. That's everything that's sinful, everything that goes against him. That's more than we can imagine. That's what God, that's who God is. That's what he died. That's what Christ laid his life down for. Rejoice in knowing that God is a loving God. His grace is upon us because of the life and work of Jesus Christ. His grace, his love for us. So what do we do? How do I, how do we get out of this mess that, that our passage is talking about? We talked about the good news in verses four through seven. Oh, I'm sorry, in verses four and five. Paul's talking before, he's talking about how bad it was. Man, he's a fallen world, fallen nature, sinfulness. And then in verse 4, he says something beautiful. He says something beautiful. You know what it is? He says, but God. So he's telling us, it's this bad, it's this bad, it's this bad. You're here the whole, all the world, all of society, all of humanity is going to be condemned to eternal damnation. But God. But God. Wow. That's awesome. That, no, there's no be more beautiful uh, words than that. No words better loving, no words better, more richly said than that. But God. These are words of encouragement. The words, but God, are two of the most precious words in the entire Bible. Because God is now intervening. God is stepping in to humanity. God in all his holiness and glory is coming into filth, the filth of humanity, where you and I live, where we reside. He's stepping in. He's intervening. God's grace, his holy love for us is the fountain from where all his mercies flow. That is a merciful God. But man, that's love. Love. He went in. It's also described in other parts of the, the Old Testament. It talks about how God reaches into the fire and grabs the branch that's flaming, and that's you and me, and he pulls us out of the fires of hell, still smoldering. God's God. So if the definition of God's grace for us is his love and mercy, how is it carried out? How does it come to fruition? It is carried out. It is summed up in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ha. Ah. Do a Google on love. It should show you Jesus Christ. And it probably doesn't, but it should. Love. Love. The, the very nature, the very definition of love is Jesus Christ. God's loving grace through Christ is revealed in the, in the New Testament. One of the, if not the most famous verse in the New Testament. What is it? What is it? The most famous verse in the New Testament. What is it? What is it? John chapter 3. Verse 16, there you go, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, amen, amen, you can say it with me, that whomever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life, amen. Now, when we look at that, when we look at that verse, we, we tend to gravitate to the first part where it says, so for God so loved the world. I mean, that's beautiful. For God so loved the world. But the most important part of that verse is that he gave us. He gave us his son. He gave us his son. God gave us his son. God gave up his son for you, for you personally. You, you, put your name there. He gave the son of God incarnate for you personally to save you. He loves you. God has given you his son, Jesus Christ. He has given you his son. God, through Christ, 
we are now reconciled to God and his wrath no longer is against us. Now all we have from God is his love, his love because of Christ, Christ. Grace defined. What is the definition of grace? Grace is a free gift of God the Father through the life and work of Jesus Christ on the cross bestowed upon you by the power of the Holy Spirit. That it certainly is grace, grace defined. So now let's look real quick at the third part of this passage. The third part of this passage is that why does God give us this grace? What is, what is it for? What's the purpose? What do we do now? What do you do now, you Christian? God's grace cha changed us for oh, good works. Unto good works. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. The question naturally arises is that the uh, that you may be thinking about for right now is that how does all this happen? What is the mechanism by which this all takes place? And verse 8 answers that question. It says, for by grace, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift from God. It is saying that you're saved by God's grace by faith, by believing in the promises of God. And even that faith is a gift from God. Even the faith to believe in him is a gift from God. That's a loving God. Now, we may feel that it's from us, and it is. It's coming from us. But to believe, to, to receive it, that's a gift even from God. It's all a gift from God. I've told this story before. I worked as an undercover cop when I was a cop in Houston. I went from uniform services to plain clothes. And so I had to go into the badlands of Houston, Texas, the badlands where there's the bad people of the world living, doing bad stuff. Okay, you cannot go in there in a uniform and try to put people in jail, you know, bust people for what all the criminal stuff they're doing. So I worked undercover. I was an undercover cop. I was a plain clothes cop. I, I didn't want to look like a cop, so I grew my hair. I grew a beard. I, 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 I got to know the lingo. I got to blend in to the world, society. Now, listen, I knew I was a cop, but I was working undercover to go into the world. Okay, here's something that we need to hear. There are people who claim to be Christian, but for some reason, they sound like the world, they look like they behave like the world, they do the bad things that the world is doing. They look just like the world, the badlands of the world, the sinful world. They look just like that. And I'm thinking like, man, they must be working undercover. Is there such a thing as an undercover Christian? No. God does not want you to be an undercover Christian. There's no such thing as that. You are to act. You are not to act in the way of the sinful world. See, this is change. This is how it all changes. This is a perceptional change. This is a, a major life change when we're born again. We are now salt, the salt of the earth. We are now light. We're the light of the world. We're reflecting Christ. We are not to act like the world. But some Christians... They certainly look like they're working like undercover in the world, but they're because they're living just like it, and you are not to live like the world. In fact, it's it's like you're from another, you're from somewhere else. And you God has you in this broken world so you can reflect Christ and share the gospel. That's why He has you here. He has you here. God has intervened in your life, but God, God's grace has changed everything about you. God's grace has changed you to do now good works. Good works, that's what it talks about in verse 
10 of this passage. You are now a new creation, Kirsten. You are now a new creation. Now you're embedded in the world and you go to work and you go to school and you do the fun stuff of school and work, but you're not from here anymore. And you can do things that you enjoy doing. Of course you can. God has blessed you with that. Have fun. Enjoy the blessing of life that God has given you. But never forget who you belong to. And everything you do, you do for his glory. You work. You work for his glory. You go to school for his glory. You play basketball. You play football. You play. You do the things for his glory. That means you can go all out. You go all out. For his glory. It is about him now. Everything has changed. You know, in, in the verse 10, it says, uh, it talks about that we are God's workmanship. You know, we're built for good works now, workmanship. Well, the Greek word, this is interesting. Think about this. The Greek word for workmanship is also can be translated as a poem or a poet. So it's like God said, telling you, you are God's poem. You are God's poet living a life for his glory. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful to think that God now has you as like, hey, you're my poem to the world. A poem rejoicing in me. You are my poet. You sing praises. And the world can listen and rejoice with you. That is amazing. As a new creation, you are living now for the glory of God. Our love for God is changed. We now belong to him. He is the one we love the most. Let us pray.